So now, ladies and gentlemen, we start the artificial intelligence and analytics in the IoT domain. We start off with a very interesting talk by Mr. Frank Thiel, VP and GM of MicroSemi. He drives the strategy, revenue growth, manage MicroSemi's big signal and RFIC business. This includes ULP, lower power, radio product line, RF Wi-Fi product line, high efficiency power management products, high reliability products, so forth. But today, he's not going to be talking about the semiconductor product portfolio and so forth. His talk will be centered around from Indus to IoT, a journey through civilizations in time regarding how this whole cognitive AI analytics came into being. Welcome, Frank. Good morning, everybody. I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. All right, so uh, I, uh, I'm sort of used to normally doing technical or business talks or talking about numbers or, or things like that. So it's kind of exciting to be able to talk about a more, what I hope is a more inspirational topic. Uh, and notice it's the last thing right before the break. So uh, that often seems to be my spot where I, I present and everyone's waiting to get some coffee or, or something like that. So I, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll go through this and I hope uh, it'll, it'll lead you into that. So um, to start off with, how is the Indus Valley and the IoT, how are these related to each other? And in fact, when I was first starting on this talk, I thought, well, that pretty much leaves me wide open to write about anything since we're starting at about 3000 BCE and coming all the way to the present. But uh, there are some interesting connections to make. Before I get into a little bit of the history though, I wanted to talk about you know, what is the IoT? We've been talking about it here. Everybody here works in it. Uh, and so uh, what I wanted to do is step back a little bit and just think about what, what exactly is the Internet of Things. I remember when this term first came around uh, about 13, 14 years ago. Uh, I think it kind of evolved over time. There's lots of definitions. This is the one uh, I kind of like the most. So it's uh, a set of interrelated computing devices, mechanical, machines, objects, animals, and people, each given a unique identifier and the ability to transfer data uh, without human interaction. That last part is kind of the key. So. Um, if you think about an IoT sensor device, and this is something in our business we think about a lot because we do uh, very low power RF, uh, what are the minimum requirements you need for an IoT sensor? Well, the first is you need to have something you want to sense and that you're interested in, right? The next is you need some means of transporting that data. Usually that's over a, uh, a wireless link. Uh, and uh, although it could be wired. And lastly, you've got to have some way to power it. So now, hopefully we'll uh, do a little better than the pictures that are here. But since this is a historical talk, I thought I'd go back to uh, how, this, how this would have looked like if we did it in the 19th century. Um, in 1926, Nikola Tesla, uh, in an interview with Collier's Magazine said, when wireless is perfectly applied to the whole earth, the whole earth will be converted into a huge brain, which in fact it is, all things being particles of a real and rhythmic whole. And the instruments through which we shall be able to do this will be amazingly simple compared with our present telephone, which was a relatively new thing at the time. And the most prescient thing he said in this quote is, a man will be able to carry one in his pocket. So think about that in 1926. That seems like an unimaginable idea. Today, of course, everybody has probably not one, but two, three, five gadgets they're carrying with them. So how does the IoT help us affect, help us with our, live our lives? I think we all know this. Everybody here works in this industry, so I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but we can connect everything. You know, presence, uh, 
you know, chemical and gas, humidity, moisture levels, pretty much anything that has something we want to sense, we can figure out a way to sense it. Everyone knows this will be huge. Uh, I was trying to find any one source that quotes the same number. Nobody does. So I just picked a couple different numbers out of there. Uh, starting with Forbes, uh, has it at uh, 267 billion by 2020. Um, and uh, Markets and Markets has it at 561 billion by 2022. No doubt, though, the curve goes this way. I think Raul had a number by 2027 of uh, 4 trillion, I think. So uh, anyway, it's going to be a big number. So let me go back in time a little bit, and we'll talk about a little bit of a timeline for the IoT. And I'll, I'll warn you, I was highly selective. I skipped all kinds of history just to make things I personally found interesting. This picture, by the way, is uh, of the Colossus machine. I'll talk about that in a second. So 1832 is the invention of the telegraph. And in 1844 uh, was the first Morse code message sent. And that message was, what hath God wrought? Kind of a serious sounding message. Um, skipping way forward in time in this picture, Alan Turing and his team in uh, Bletchley Park during World War II invented the, one of the, considered one of the first computers is the Colossus uh, that was used to crack the uh, what the Germans believed was an uncrackable code with their Enigma machines. Um, so uh, that's very often founded as one of the earliest computing devices. Skipping way forward, 1969, ARPANET was created. ARPANET is the first sort of pre-runner to the internet. Right? So that was the very first time the idea of sharing uh, between multiple devices was there. Then uh, uh, 1998, and related to the internet, is when Google was incorporated. And then lastly, for this uh, conference, the uh, IoT term was uh, first coined, or at least it was first published in 2003, 2004, uh, as a term. So right here, I actually pulled this uh, chart yesterday or the day before. Um, this is the Google, you can, you can go to Google's analytics services, and uh, this is the trend of the term IoT. So you'll see starting in 2004, uh, all the way up to relatively about five years ago is when we first started seeing people uh, talking about it. Below is a map of uh, where people are most commonly uh, doing that search from. The thing I found most interesting about this is uh, you'll see and I didn't put everything, but I picked a handful of countries. You'll see India is sixth, the USA, 27th. So what does that tell us? I think there's more interest here, perhaps, than even in the USA is what you could conclude. But this talk is about the Indus Valley and its relationship to the IoT. So long before that term was coined, let's go back in time. The Indus Valley and the Harappan Civilization. Uh, and you can see on the map here, uh, I'm guessing a lot of folks may know uh, uh, some about this. But uh, it's in uh, basically what's now Pakistan and Northwest India. Uh, and the civilization was uh, uh, first believed to have been started in 3300 BCE with a peak in 2600. Uh, to 1900 BCE. Um, what's most fascinating about it is it appears to have been a peaceful, organized, very practical, and hygienic society. Um, the other thing uh, that makes us believe it was peaceful is that uh, the largest buildings that they found and excavated are believed to be granaries you know, for storing grain as opposed to uh, giant temples or huge castles for people that are running society. Uh, technologically, in the Indus Valley, uh, the civilization is credited with doing the very first standard weights and measures. Things we take for granted today, but 
you know, it would do us no good at all if you had an IoT device that was trying to transmit um, how many uh, liters of water went by if nobody could even agree on what a liter was. So having standardized that was, was uh, an amazing thing. And the other thing is that uh, each house uh, drew water from a well, but had, a, in essence, an early sewage system that allowed them to drain the wastewater to the street. And what's interesting is uh, this, the systems they have now are actually more advanced even than some cities today. Um, if you look at uh, this picture on the left here, and even the picture on the right, another invention of the uh, Indus Valley was uh, bricks, hardened, moisture resistant, and uniform bricks. They allowed the construction of things like in the foreground on the picture uh, on, on the left, yes, is uh, what's a great bath. So that has to be a waterproof vessel to store that. So um, this was a modern urban culture. At, at its peak, the Indus Valley was believed to be about five million people. Um, the cities were known for urban planning. Uh, and to do that, you need a whole lot of not only technical expertise, but political expertise. The political part is to agree that no, this road should be here, the granary should be here, um, and I'd really like the bath to be next to my house, not to his house, whatever. You have to all agree on these things. The city of today. Um, we talked about smart cities, I think uh, both uh, Bart and Rahul both talked about these. Um, you've got uh, all ability to put all sorts of different sensors all over the city. Um, uh, Professor Goldsmith at the Harvard Kennedy School had said in terms of uh, city governance, we're in, at the most consequential periods in history right now. Because there's a, uh, there's political, there's obviously the technical and uh, practical aspects of putting sensors in the city, but there's also the political aspects and how the government uses these, privacy, things like that. So to have a smart city, you need cloud computing, machine learning, IoT sensors, smartphone apps. This data can be used by the government. It can be used by people. It can be used for lots of different things. And I'm going to talk about a few different uh, things that some cities have done. So in 1964, uh, Marshall McLuhan, who, who did a lot of writing on a lot of philosophical modern things in 1964, said, by means of electric media, we set up a dynamic by which all previous technologies, including cities, will be translated into information systems. Again, 1964, long before anybody had a smartphone or there was any even kind of networking connections. So what's an example of something you can do to make your city smart? The London Underground. So the London Underground has been around for, in some cases, more than 100 years. Many of these tunnels were dug a long, long time ago. And a lot of the tunnel infrastructure is still in place from those days. And as you can imagine, some of it's decaying. Rather than go in and say, well, we're going to just replace everything, we're going to tear up all of London and try to replace the London Underground, uh, there's a company that put in a system of uh, sensors all over to monitor cracks, to monitor tilt, and to make decisions as to where they needed to go in and address what needs to be improved. Enhanced parking. So everybody knows what it's like trying to find a parking space. Very, very manual process of driving around, eventually getting madder and madder, and eventually maybe you go home or, or you find some place far, far away. Uh, there's multiple companies that are doing wireless parking sensors uh, with enhanced analytics as well, actually, to, to process that data. And on top of that, there's another company looking at doing automated parking, where you actually take your car, pull it in, you get out. You've got a smartphone app, say I'm parking. It measures your car, reads your license plate, and then stows it into a garage for you. 
uh, and you can get it back by calling it back on your iPhone app. Asset tracking. So asset tracking is perhaps, uh, that's been around forever. Uh, it's one of the things that allows you to uh, keep track of where things are. There's many, many technologies for this. I have a picture of RFID here, which is a passive technology. But there's many, many active technologies as well that are used for doing this. The asset tracking industry alone, this is a chart of just that. It's projected growth through 2022 is, is, is huge. So let me go back and talk about the uh, Indus Valley again. One of the most common artifacts that's been found are these seals. And these seals were used, some of them have pictures of animals, they have pictures of people, uh, they may have been gods, they, uh, they're not sure, but uh, they were known for the seal carving. And it's been one of the most important artifacts in tracing the Indus Valley because by locating where those are found geographically, they know about how big the civilization had spread. They were used to identify property, stamp clay, uh, and it's, uh, 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 in general used to identify things, to identify assets. So again, very much the same ideas that we're seeing uh, with the Internet of Things in a very manual way. So using all of what we've talked about and showing this timeline again, we could maybe go back a little bit farther and say that you know the Internet of Things, some of the ideas that we talk about today of what we want to do with the Internet of Things could be traced all the way back to you know, 3300 BC, the Bronze Age. But let's jump forward again to today. I was talking about cities and things you can do. And I wanted to talk a little bit more, perhaps, about health. Um, here's an example of citizens using sensors that are then providing useful data to the city. So in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, a thousand uh, sensor-equipped inhalers were given to people uh, that had asthma. And what these sensors do is they've got GPS, they've got time of day, uh, and they measure where and when and how often inhalers were used. It's a company called Propeller Health in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. With that information, they looked at the worst spots and actually decided to uh, plant belts of trees in areas that had the most use of uh, the asthma inhalers. And uh, this achieved a 60% reduction in particulate matter. So something useful for our health. Now let's talk about the human body itself. And this is, you know, this is something we work in specifically. Uh, Microsemi is uh, uh, the world leader, in fact, in implantable radios. So uh, you can think of that as IoT within the body. And what are things that you implant in your body used for? Well, they, uh, there's pacemakers for controlling your heart rhythm, defibrillators to uh, shock you if you've, your heart has stopped. You can manage pain. You can manage epilepsy. You can manage blood pressure. You can manage even uh, sleep apnea. And there's even people working on other uh, techniques to actually help cure heart disease. Um, and what's common to all of that is needing a radio that goes in there. Um, Microsemi actually created the world's first mixed band radio. The mixed band is, stands for a medical uh, implant communication service. And it's a dedicated worldwide band at 402 to 405 megahertz that can only be used for implanted medical radios. Um, so we are the world leader in that, mainly because we have the lowest power radios. These are used uh, all across the world. We've also done ASICs for hearing aids uh, to enable, uh, we actually had the first RF hearing aids that could uh, talk to each other, as well as the, uh, a pill camera that uh, we designed an ASIC for a company who decided to do uh, pill cameras. And what's the pill camera used for? It's to replace uh, you know, what previously would have been a colonoscopy or ways to look at your intestinal tract. So I wanted to uh, 
show you one of these. I don't know how much everybody can see this from the back or see that it's flashing. So this is a pill camera. I don't see, know if you can see how big this is relative to my mouth, but you can, it looks kind of big to swallow to me. But that's exactly what these are used for. When you swallow this, it takes pictures. It's flashing just like any other camera and transmits video outside of your body. And that video is then recorded on something you wear on your belt. And somebody always asked me this question, but that is a single use device, just for anybody who, before you, before you ask. Um, Bluetooth technology. This is another technology that's being used in, uh, uh, increasingly into Internet of Things. Uh, Bluetooth originally was used mostly for, as everybody knows, to do a headset connected to your phone. It's the original uh, connectivity technology that was in smartphones, and even before smartphones and flip phones. Uh, it's still the uh, dominant peripheral technology. Uh, the Bluetooth committee has been doing a lot of work to extend this. They've added mesh. They've added long range modes. They're going to allow this to be used as well for more Internet of Things applications. Interestingly, it's the next wave in medical as well. So I was talking about the mixed band on the previous slides. This is going to be used as well in uh, medical devices. Um, we're actually working on and, and have out uh, prototypes of uh, what's the lowest power, most advanced uh, Bluetooth SOC used for medical applications. Um, it's got a lot of advanced security features that, that Martin talked about as well. Uh, nodes of trust and things like that that are built into it uh, because that is so important uh, as time goes on. So there's a quote. This quote has sometimes been uh, attributed to Mother Teresa although I, I found no evidence she actually ever said this. But it's, we have done so much with so little for so long that we are now qualified to make anything out of nothing. So that, that takes a minute to, to think about what, what that might mean. Uh, but we've come a long way since the Indus Valley. So you might ask, what happened to these folks? You know, why don't we see a linear... Uh, version of that civilization. Why was that civilization lost? And it wasn't even unearthed till uh, the late 19th century. Um, so there's no definitive answer that I could find at least. Um, but the leading causes seem to be believed to be uh, the drying of the Saraswati River, uh, as well as the, the likelihood there was a giant flood that struck the area. Um, so Climate change was the likely reason the civilization declined. Um, and there's reasons to believe that aside from it being a war or something like that because lots of aspects of the civilization were found elsewhere. Whereas if there had been a war, that would be less likely. So climate change is the main reason. So does that sound familiar to problems we have to solve today? Climate change is impacting today's society uh, these are some pictures from just, a, you know, within the last two months. The last two months, if you think about that. So near where I live, I live in Austin, Texas. Uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, ravaged Houston, Texas. Shortly, a few weeks after that, Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico and, and devastated most of the island. And around the same time as Hurricane Harvey hit Texas, as many of you here may know, monsoons and flooding in India and Nepal and Bangladesh struck. 2017 is the hottest and wettest year ever. So what's the killer app for the IoT? Now, it's believed, and I actually have a picture here from a presentation from Ericsson, uh, that uh, the killer app will be combating climate change. Uh, everything we've talked about today, you know, connected light bulbs, air conditioners, and everything that can enable better power management. If you enable better power management, you need to produce less power. Um, so smart systems that are aware of usage patterns can, can be used to smartly uh, reduce the power that we use. Cars that are aware of each other reduce fuel usage. I could 
you know, make 20 pages, you could probably do better than I on coming up with things that we could do to solve that. Um, Internet of Things, uh, again, in Erickson's presentation, they talked about that being a 15% reduction in greenhouse gases just due to using the Internet of Things. So I wanted to talk about something we don't often think about as being a source of climate change, but uh, smart livestock. Cattle, uh, in particular, uh, are uh, uh, believed to, so uh, to make a burger, for instance, in places where you have a burger, takes more power than to power seven iPads, 28 times more land than chicken, 11 times more water, and five times more climate warming uh, emissions. Uh, and the cattle alone, and actually not just cattle, but all animals alone, could lead to roughly a fifth of the climate changing uh, gases that are produced. So uh, not that we want to think about that, but uh, that's, that's a, one of the leading causes is, uh, is that. Um, People are working on this with, uh, with solutions, so monitoring cattle, monitoring their health. Uh, we have a, a low power radio uh, that's used for this uh, purpose as well that can monitor the head position of cows or their necks, and this is for producing milk, by the way. Uh, this can increase herd survival and the production of milk. But also, more and more people have been working on meat substitutes. Uh, these have gotten better and better. There are substitutes uh, for uh, leather, substitutes for meat, substitutes for virtually anything that will reduce the need to, uh, to uh, have as much livestock. Now, I'm not trying to make a political statement or anything like that. It's really just because I'm talking about this mostly just because it really is one of the biggest causes of, uh, of uh, climate change, and it's something the IoT can absolutely help. So, going back to the Indus Valley, we believe what we talked about about them, they probably would have welcomed the IoT technologies to help them. So, maybe it would have looked like this. That's the iPhone 10, by the way. So, right up to date. <laughs> and with that, think about where we could go in the future. Elon Musk, uh, who did the Tesla and SpaceX uh, just a few months ago gave a talk about Mars as the next uh, place to go. So these are actually some pictures of some of the cities we could evolve to in the future. And with that, I thank you. This is, this is just incredible, 5,000 years in half an hour. <laughs> so any, any questions for Frank? I guess everybody is overwhelmed One back there. going through the history. Yeah, please. Uh, hi. Uh, one question I have is, uh, you told that Ericsson said that uh, by using IoT, 15% energy could be saved. So did they consider the amount of energy which will be needed to produce those uh, parts of IoT, those micro PCBs, batteries? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't quite. So, so did, they, did they consider the energy that would be utilized to make these IoT devices? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, probably not. Uh, and actually, this is... It's an interesting question because that's often one of the things about electric cars as well. So you look at the, the carbon footprint of the car itself when it's on the road is much better than a gasoline car. But if you count the carbon footprint to actually produce the battery and all of that, it's not quite as good. So kind of the same, same point, I think. Great, any, any other quick one, one last question? Out there, please. Hi, thanks, thanks a lot for the excellent presentation. I'm Ulla Koivukoski, Finland Avanta Ventures. 
So my question is that instead of uh, uh, putting all that effort to get to Mars, can we somehow put the same effort to save the globe? <laughs> what, what should happen to make it happen? I would agree with you. <laughs> I, uh, I think uh, the idea of going to Mars is uh, Elon Musk has his SpaceX company, and uh, he has to have some place, he has to have a target to go to. So whether going to Mars is practical or not, probably not. I, it's just it's an interesting it's an interesting thing you could do. Great, thank you, thank you, Frank. I would request Thanks. I would request Krishna to come on stage to give him to give Frank an award, please.